Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone throughout the world. Hello and welcome. My name is Suzanne Stalls and I am the director for maternal and newborn health for Momentum Country and Global Leadership, a USAID funded project. We are hosting this technical consultation with USAID and in collaboration with the World Health Organization and the United Nations Population Fund. So this maternal mental health technical consultation is a convening of global stakeholders with more than a thousand registered here today to give voice to this silent burden and to ensure that this burden is silenced no more. Together, we represent numerous communities who often do not have the opportunity to come together. I welcome my colleagues from the maternal world, the newborn child health, nutrition, mental health communities who are with us now and in the coming days to learn, collaborate, and act. I'd like to begin this important convening with a series of prepared and recorded remarks by our distinguished partners who have lent their leadership to this important issue. It is my distinct honor now to introduce our first guest, Dr. Jennifer Adams. Dr. Adams is currently the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator in the USAID Bureau for Global Health. She has served in USAID for the past 25 years, holding positions in the Central Asian Republics, Senegal, Brazil, Washington, DC, and most recently as the USAID Mission Director in Mozambique. <clears throat> Her positions included economist and managing social sector portfolios, including health, education, and environmental projects. Thank you for providing such strong leadership on behalf of USAID, Dr. Abrams. Please go ahead. Well, welcome, uh, colleagues and friends all around the world. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure uh, to be with you here today on behalf of the US Agency for International Development to talk about a critical but uh, overlooked issue, maternal mental health. First, I'd like to share the deep regret of our administrator, Samantha Power, who cannot be here today due to other commitments. But as I think you know, she's a dedicated champion of human rights and she's a mother herself. So she is certainly here with us uh, today in spirit. I'd also like to extend my thanks to our host, the USAID-funded Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project, and to UNFPA and to WHO, who are our longstanding and invaluable collaborators. WHO Director General Dr. Tedros recently said, if there was ever a time to invest in mental health, it's now, and we cannot agree more. Good mental health is a fundamental human right, important for the pursuit of a life of dignity and prosperity. Mental health and psychosocial well-being have long fallen behind physical health in terms of attention, funding, and action, despite a massive global burden and an unmet need. One in four individuals will experience poor mental health at some point in their lives, and 80% of these individuals are living in low- and middle-income countries that often face a multitude of other health challenges. Women are particularly vulnerable to mental health challenges because of complex gender inequities, as well as biological factors that occur during pregnancy and childbirth. Globally, one in five women will experience at least one perinatal mental health disorder, including anxiety or depression, and rates have been significantly higher amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Poor mental health poses significant and lasting implications negatively affecting women's health and quality of life and the outcomes for newborns, infants, and children. Evidence shows that poor mental health during pregnancy and after childbirth can lead to increases in stillbirth, preterm birth, and low weight birth. Also decreased rates of breastfeeding, missed immunizations, and overall delays in child growth and development. As an economist, I understand the critical link between health and economic prosperity. Unsurprisingly, data show a link between mental health and poverty, which with each reinforcing the other in a complex negative cycle. And the cost of poor mental health does not rest on families alone. 
An estimated 12 billion productive days are lost each year due to depression and anxiety, which costs the world's economy about $2.5 trillion through reduced economic productivity and the direct cost of care. By 2030, estimates project that that cost will rise even further to almost $6 trillion. USAID recognizes that healthy women and families are the cornerstone of an enduring and prosperous society. Investing in mental health now can put us on a positive path for the future. For each dollar invested toward improving mental health and well-being, $4 are returned. Integration of maternal mental health into existing healthcare delivery systems will be critical to the quality, cost effectiveness, and sustainability of these services. Through our partners, USAID is now incorporating mental health support into our small and sick newborn care, infant malnutrition, and routine antenatal and postnatal care programs. We look forward to continuing to elevate this critical issue and to ensure that women everywhere have access to quality, respectful care for both their physical and their mental well-being. Thank you all for your time and participation, and I look forward to the outcomes of a successful consultation. I now have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Natalia Kanem to this important dialogue. Dr. Kanem currently serves as the Acting Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, and prior to which she was the Deputy Executive Director and earlier UNFP Representative in the United Republic of Tanzania from 2014 to 2016. She brings to the position more than three decades of strategic leadership and management in the fields of medicine, public health, international peace and development, human rights and social justice, and has specific expertise in direct program implementation mission advocacy, and in building strong local, national, international, and donor partner alliances. Thank you for lending your voice to this convening, Dr. Kanem. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, on behalf of UNFPA, the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, and with our partners, USAID and the World Health Organization, I thank you for joining this consultation, for helping to inform the path forward for maternal mental health. Mental health, it is a human right, and it is central to human dignity. Our community, historically, has focused on the physical survival of women and children. And too often, we have to admit we've overlooked the need to integrate mental health into routine care. Globally, maternal mental health remains significantly underfunded, even though approximately 10% of pregnant women and 13% of postpartum women experience common mental health conditions like depression, like anxiety. When left unaddressed, these conditions can have a lasting impact on the health and well-being of women and also their newborns. In some cases, it can lead to death by suicide. The focus of our consultation is the perinatal period between pregnancy and two years after birth. It's a critical time frame. It's associated with an increased incidence of mental health conditions. It is also worth noting that the mental health needs of vulnerable groups, including women living in humanitarian settings and women living in poverty, deserve special attention. We're well positioned, it's true, to provide treatment and preventive care to pregnant and postpartum women in low and middle income countries. Meeting the challenge will mean ensuring that women receive respectful care, person centered care. That is what they need, that is what they're demanding, and that is exactly what they deserve. This will require accelerated research. It's going to require sharing learning and practical implementation strategies. So together with our partners, UNFPA will be right there promoting mental health and psychosocial support in emergency settings and helping to create those safe spaces 
for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. UNFPA also provides training for midwives. Midwives ensure that women have the knowledge that they need to deliver safely. And it's the knowledge and the skill of the midwife and her ability, sometimes his ability, to provide compassionate care. This is what is going to help with maternal mental health. During the pandemic, UNFPA has developed online training on perinatal mental health, specifically for midwives. And there's still so much more to do to support women and to end the stigma that still remains around mental health. Achieving universal health coverage needs to be a priority for the international community. This includes access. Access to mental health is an integral part of sexual and reproductive health care. We, therefore, call on all our partners to integrate mental health and psychosocial support across our development efforts and to address preventable maternal morbidities as part of our commitment to end preventable maternal deaths by the year 2030. That's the deadline for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. UNFPA is committed to work with all of you to make this more than a dream. It has to be reality. And I look forward to fruitful discussions today towards that noble end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khanum. I'm now honored to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Shujana Yaakov, who's the Deputy Director General of the World Health Organization. Prior to this current uh, appointment in 2019, Dr. Yaakov served as the WHO Regional Director of Europe since 2010. She's held a number of high profile policy positions in the last three decades, including as the founding director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Stockholm, Sweden. Between 2005 and 2010, she built the center into an internationally respected center of excellence in the fight against infectious diseases. Dr. Jakob? Good morning, good afternoon. I am pleased to welcome you to this important global technical consultation on maternal mental health hosted by USAID's Momentum Leadership in collaboration with the World Health Organization and UNFPA. Maternal mental health is an important topic for WHO. It cuts across two crucial areas, care for the women and newborn, and care for mental health. For each of these areas, we are still far from reaching the Sustainable Development Goals targets. Mental health is an integral part of WHO's definition of health. Yet, it has long been overlooked within public health programs and still has not received the attention it deserves. The same is even more true for mental health of pregnant women and mothers. Despite being a basic right for every woman and important for, for the psychosocial well-being of women and their children, Recognition of maternal mental health has not been a priority on health agendas for many countries. Depression and anxiety during pregnancy and the postpartum period are leading causes of disability in women around the world. In low- and middle-income countries, the prevalence of perinatal depression is estimated to be 15 to 20 percent. Despite the high burden of illness, less than 20 percent of these women report their symptoms to health workers, probably due to stigma and poor care-seeking practices inherently associated with these conditions. In addition, depression and anxiety have a profound impact on the mother, parent, 
infant relationship, which is the foundation of the future emotional, relational, and social development of the child. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have heard many stories about the disruption to maternal care services, worries about COVID-19 infection during pregnancy and breastfeeding, socioeconomic consequences of lockdowns, the many difficult situations. All this must have led to more anxiety and stress among pregnant and postpartum women at a time when access to services were difficult. The disruption of critical mental health services in 93% of countries worldwide, while the demand for mental health is increasing according to a survey conducted by WHO in 130 countries, has played into this. WHO has issued guidance to countries on how to maintain essential services, including maternal and mental health services, during COVID-19, and recommends that countries allocate resources to maternal and mental health as an integral component of their response and recovery plans, and urges countries to monitor changes and disruptions in services so that they can address them as required. With the disruption in health services, countries are finding innovative ways to provide maternal and mental health care and initiatives to strengthen psychosocial support have sprung up. Yet, because of the scale of the problem, the vast majority of mental health needs remain unaddressed. The response is hampered by chronic underinvestment in mental health promotion, prevention and care for many years before the pandemic. Investment is also urgently needed for maternal health. Midwives are a crucial human resource for maternity care services and whose supportive care contributes to improved experience of care for women and families, as well as positive birth outcomes. The recent State of the World's Midwifery Report, led by UNFPA, WHO, and the International Confederation of Midwives, highlights the global workforce shortage for maternity care. We now have an opportunity to build back better and address these gaps. In order to ensure that no one is left behind in our commitment to accelerate progress made to date and reach our 2030 goals, we must put high priority and allocate necessary resources to maternity care and to mental health programs. Health systems and those caring for pregnant and postpartum women should consider how they can better address women's mental health needs, ensuring the skills and services are in place to identify, refer, diagnose, and manage mental health issues during pregnancy and the postpartum period, and provide a respectful, positive experience and care throughout the perinatal period. WHO has just finalized the postnatal care guidelines, which should be released in early 2022, and will serve as an example of ensuring mental health needs are integrated into maternal and newborn health efforts within WHO. We know that maternal mental health and infant outcomes are so closely linked, and thus integrating programs and targets, these in routine 
maternal and child health services would improve maternal and child health outcomes, early childhood development, and the mother-parent-infant relationship. I am pleased that WHO is collaborating on this important technical consultation represented by different departments who work on maternal, newborn, and child, as well as mental health issues. I very much look forward to hearing about the discussions to take place at this week's technical consultation, and thank you for being part of it. Thank you very much, Dr. Jakob. And last but certainly not least is our Director of USAID's Momentum Country and Global Leadership Award, Dr. Koki Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal is an internationally recognized expert in safe motherhood, reproductive health, and family planning policies and programs, as well as promoting policy dialogue and advocacy for policy reform. She has more than 25 years of service delivery experience in reproductive health, family planning, and maternal health, and for over two decades has led, managed, and implemented large-scale USAID-funded global health projects. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Koki Agarwal. Thank you for joining us today and in the coming days for this important maternal mental health technical consultation. My name is Koki Agarwal, and as the director of USAID's Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project, I am pleased to be co-hosting this critical convening with USAID and alongside our strong partners, UNFPA and WHO. Momentum Country and Global Leadership is a five-year project with a presence currently in over 18 countries. We work with host country governments and provide technical assistance and capacity development support to local partners to improve maternal, newborn, and child health and family planning outcomes. Our vision is to support countries to accelerate and sustain their progress towards improvement in health of their populations. We also know that particularly critical time to identify and address mental health concerns is during the perinatal period, between pregnancy and up to two years after birth. Common perinatal mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, and somatic disorders or disorders not only pose significant and lasting implications for women's health and quality of life, but also newborn health and development that have intergenerational impacts. Despite evidence that effective psychosocial and health promotion interventions exist, maternal mental health remains a silent burden that has not yet received the full political and programmatic attention it deserves from the global community. I echo my colleagues that maternal mental health is a human right and is at the core of human dignity. Now is the time to move beyond the physical well-being of mothers and children and ensure that pregnant and postpartum women receive the respectful and nurturing care they deserve. The burden of unmet need for such services is high and the ongoing pandemic and humanitarian crisis occurring across the globe and our continued work in fragile settings makes this a truly critical time to learn, collaborate, and act to ensure all women worldwide are reached. This three-day technical consultation will bring together members of respective communities to collaborate with one another and design a collective way forward to strengthen the maternal mental health research agenda, the implementation approaches, and integration within current health services and programs. Together, we represent the maternal, newborn, child health, nutrition and mental health communities who are here today and in the coming days to listen and learn from one another. We aren't able to convene together as often as we are busy doing the work of our own respective communities. But I know I'm personally thrilled to have colleagues in the mental health community here with us so that I can learn from them myself. I'm confident that each of you considers yourself an avid listener. This is the moment and the opportunity to take advantage of this critical time and show a bit of humility with one another. We don't have all the answers. This is going to require that we roll up our sleeves and do the hard work. The road to 2030 is right around the corner. 
We are coming together from respective communities, but we share a common goal and commitment to giving voice to this silent burden. I ask that you be open, engage in dialogue, and learn from one another during this co-learning space that is this technical consultation provides for. Challenge the status quo, demand change, and ask tough questions. By doing so, you would be contributing to strengthened health programs and services that give women the care they deserve. I look forward to learning alongside you, listening and sharing my own personal experiences in the hope that they can be helpful so that we can help create the lasting change we are all here for and hope to achieve. Thank you for being here with us and defining a path for our journey together. And thanks so much, Koki, for setting the stage for us for the next several days. And many thanks to our partners, USAID, WHO, UNFPA for their critical leadership and for lending not only their voice, but their commitment to tackling this important priority of maternal mental health. I'd now like to introduce all of you to our day one facilitator, Charity Ndwiga. Charity is an experienced midwife with 25 years of experience and implementation of RMNCH programs and over 10 years of experience in public health research. Her focus is in providing programmatic and technical support to a variety of RMNCH research activities that generate the evidence that's needed for improved understanding of critical maternal health issues and addressing barriers to access, quality of MNH services, and strengthening of maternal newborn child health delivery services. But before I turn it over to Charity, I would like to share with all of you a video we produced with your help that sets the stage as to why we are all here. And thank you, and once again, welcome to day one.
Thank you, Susan, and esteemed speakers for our first opening plenary. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us from all over the world. I am thrilled to welcome you to our first ever maternal mental health technical consultation. My name is Charity Ndwiga, and I'm joining you from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm, a, I'm excited to serve you as a day one facilitator for this important convening. During the, this technical consultation, we have the opportunity to gather together uh, the mental health and newborn health uh, communities together alongside uh, with those in mental health community, sharing ideas and approaches to accelerate uh, progress to the journey to 2020 and ensuring that we give voice to this silent burden and elevate maternal mental health during this pandemic and beyond. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We'll be active on social media throughout the proceedings, and we welcome you to engage with fellow attendees. Our technical uh, hashtag is Maternal Mental Health Tech uh, Con 21, alongside with Maternal MH Matters and hashtag Maternal MMH. We are dropping this information uh, and handles to follow and to tag in the, uh, in the chat. You will notice that we have simultaneous translation to English and to French uh, for select session. If you wish to hear any of these sessions in either French or English, please click uh, on the agenda tab and select the session title in your preferred language. All sessions recorded and presentations will be accessible to registered participants uh, after each day of the technical consultations. Many troubleshooting responses can also be found in our platform, navigation guide module on the learning page. And you can get in touch with us by navigating to the technical support uh, uh, channel in the platform chat. We also invite you to take advantage of numerous networking opportunities. Uh, you'll see who else is attending and participating, and you can direct uh, message those, uh, those fellow attendants by searching uh, the presentation. The participant tab. This is also covered in the platform navigation guide, and uh, and each day we offer social hours where you can informally network with participants. All speakers' bios are accessible on the platform, so you can read more about their network and and the unique perspective they bring uh, to this convening. And finally, but not certainly not the least, you'll see that we have pre-recorded some of our sessions over the next three days. This is done to ensure that there's equitable participation of each speaker who are currently in multiple time zones throughout the world. We want to allow the time and space for live uh, question and answer sessions with each, of you, uh, with each one of you. Please note that the Q&A box and the chat box are, are one and the same. Locate that immediately on your right of your video prayer and type any questions that you may have. We will do our best to respond to them in time. Uh, we have allocated for our live question and answer panels. So do not think that it is odd that we, we are watching a speaker uh, presenting and also uh, typing back to you in the chat box. We, uh, this pre -pre uh, if sessions are pre-recorded. Uh, pre Conversely, if you are presenting live, they, they'll also be able to uh, join the chat after the sessions. So do tag any speaker you'd like to message directly. We also, uh, we take multi, we are taking multitasking to a whole new level here. With, the, uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our next plenary, which will provide global overview of maternal health, mental health, mental maternal health field. Uh, uh, I wish you a, a very inspiring three days. Get to, to know each other have conversations, share your thoughts and experiences, ask questions. Uh, with those words, I will turn, now turn it over to Rebecca Levin from USID. Ms. Levin currently serves as a senior uh, maternal health advisor at the USID Bureau for Global Health and brings uh, with her more than eight years of experience in design, management, and implementation of MNCH programs across Asia. Africa and the, and the Middle East. 
She has been key reader uh, in uh, this technical consultation, bringing her strong passion for mental maternal health uh, to her role spearheading USID investment in this place. Ms. Levin, please welcome. Thank you so much, Charity. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to colleagues and friends around the world. Again, my name is Becca Levine, and I'm a senior maternal health advisor in the Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition Office in USAID's Bureau for Global Health. But like many of you, my most important job is being a parent. I'm the mom of three young boys, and my passion for maternal mental health stems from my own personal experience. I experienced debilitating anxiety and depression during and after my first pregnancy, and also dealt with the mental health challenges that come with giving birth to preemie twins who necessitated a long stay in the NICU. I know firsthand the significant impact those experiences had on my relationship with my newborns, my husband and family, and with myself. But unlike many, but I, unlike many women around the world, I had the privilege of access to quality care that helped me to improve my mental health. It was only then that my family was truly able to thrive. And so for me, this technical consultation is an incredible first step in giving voice to this silent burden and raising awareness of this critically underprioritized health issue by hearing from the true experts individuals who work on maternal mental health day in and day out. And so now it is my distinct honor to moderate this introductory plenary session entitled Global Overview of Perinatal Mental Health and Reframing the Discussion, a session that we hope will bring all of us from our diverse backgrounds to a shared common understanding of perinatal mental health in an effort to set the stage for the next three days. I'd now like to introduce our esteemed speakers whose full bios can be accessed via the agenda on the technical consultation site. Our first speaker, Sarah Barzev, is an Australian trained midwife, currently working as a midwifery technical specialist at the UNFPA headquarters in New York. Sarah has 20 years of work experience in midwifery and maternal and newborn health programs in Africa, Southeast Asia and Australia. Our second speaker, Dr. Nirja Chowdhury, is a technical officer in the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the World Health Organization headquarters. A psychiatrist by training, Nirja works closely with colleagues across WHO departments to support integration of mental health into other technical areas, including maternal and child health. Third, we will hear from Shannon McNabb, Shannon is an international public health consultant with over 15 years of experience in maternal, newborn, and child health and implementation research. Shannon is lead author of The Silent Burden, a landscape analysis of common perinatal mental disorders in low and middle income countries, conducted by Momentum Country and Global Leadership. Our next speaker is Dr. Jane Fisher, Finkel Professor of Global Public Health and Professor of Women's Health at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Fisher is a clinical psychologist and globally recognized for her research on the social determinants for women's perinatal mental health. And last but certainly not least, we will hear from Tafazwa Meki, founder of Someone Always Listens to You or SALT Africa, a mental health organization in Zimbabwe focused on Afrocentric solutions to mental health issues. Tafadzwa is a registered counseling psychologist intern with lived experience in maternal mental health. Welcome to all of our panelists, and now over to Sarah. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Bazev, and I'm a midwifery specialist from UNFPA New York. Um, my apologies that I can't join in person today, um, but it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel where I'm going to present a very brief overview of global maternal health. Next slide, please. 
So we're going to look at some of the key um, facts and definitions of maternal health uh, just to begin. So maternal health refers to um, a woman's health and well-being before, during and after pregnancy. And this encompasses all aspects of physical, um, of mental, emotional and social health. And uh, each of these stages should be, um, you know, should really be a positive experience, ensuring that women and their babies uh, reach their full potential for health and well-being. And we know that women who remain healthy during pregnancy um, and after birth are more likely to stay healthier later in life um, and have better birth outcomes. And uh, this also influences the health and the well-being and um, also the development of their child. So the definition of maternal health also includes the absence of maternal mortality and maternal morbidity. And um, in this regard, there's been some really important progress made globally in the last two decades to reduce maternal deaths by about 38% worldwide. Um, however, the pace of this mortality reduction is far too slow and about 810 women still die every day um, to mostly preventable causes. And uh, you know this number is just unacceptably high. Similarly, for newborns and children under five, um, there's been significant progress made to child survival over the past couple of decades, uh, with, with newborn deaths, sorry, um, reducing from about 5 million in 1990 to 2.4 million in 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, we know for many of these deaths, they are also preventable, and uh, this number is incredibly high. Next slide, please. So when we look at where um, the maternal deaths occur, around 95% of these occur in low resource settings and more than half of these deaths occur in fragile and humanitarian settings. Um, and just looking at the map, we can see that Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Southern Asia share the greatest burden of maternal deaths, um, you know, constituting about 86% of the global total uh, in 2017. And in fact, when we look at maternal mortality rates, um, we can really see that these, these reflect disparities between wealthy and poor countries more than any other measure of health. Next slide, please. So why do women die? Um, women die as a result of complications following, uh, during and following pregnancy and childbirth. Um, many of these complications are developed during pregnancy and uh, are preventable or treatable with high quality, timely care that's provided by a skilled uh, a care provider who is working in a supportive environment. Um, other complications uh, might exist before pregnancy, um, but are worsened during pregnancy and especially if they're not managed as part of the woman's care. The major complications that account for about 75% of all maternal deaths um, are as a result of excessive blood loss, so hemorrhage, uh, infections, high blood pressure, um, and complications related to unsafe abortion and also obstructed labour. And the remainder of the deaths are caused by or associated with infections um, such as malaria, or related to other chronic conditions such as diabetes or cardiac disease. It's uh, really important to note also that um, death from suicide is also one, in the, is one of the leading causes of death for women in the first year after giving birth in many countries. Um, and this is going to be addressed by my colleagues. So a woman's chance of dying or, or becoming disabled during pregnancy and childbirth is, is closely connected to her social and her economic status, um, and also the norms and the cultural values um, that she holds, and also the, um, the geographic remoteness of, of her home to health facilities. And generally speaking, um, the poorer and more marginalised a woman is, the greater her risk of death. And uh, we know that the risk of maternal mortality is highest for adolescent girls under 15. Next slide, please. So ending um, preventable maternal deaths must remain a, a global priority. And we always need to remember the, uh, the, the short and the long-term consequences of maternal death, um, particularly on children, uh, as it impacts their own survival um, and on the families and, and communities as well. 
But it's also critical that we expand efforts to reducing um, maternal morbidities. And these really constitute a well less, uh, a, a much well less recognised um, burden of complications which women and girls face during and uh, following pregnancy and childbirth. And um, these can have a, you know, significant implications for wellbeing throughout life. So maternal morbidity um, refers to a range of different health conditions and some of these might start during pregnancy uh, and only last a very short time, um, while other, other conditions uh, don't appear for years later and, um, and uh, continue throughout a woman's life. And it's estimated that about 20 million women annually experience morbidities related to their pregnancy or birth. And, um, you know, this is really considered to be the tip of the iceberg and, and, and really significantly underreported um, and, and certainly not well recognised or measured in many settings. And the most, the most common complications that are experienced by girls and women um, include those related to you know, cardiovascular problems, diabetes infection and uh, anemia and um, bleeding as well. And highlighted at the bottom, you see, is depression and anxiety. And these are the most common uh, morbidities of, of pregnancy and childbirth globally. Um, and uh, it's really critical that we prioritise and address on a global scale um, these uh, maternal mental health conditions, given what we know about the impact of maternal mental health on women's health and also the, um, the health and well-being and development of their infant and the impact that this also has on partners and on families in the broader community. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague Nirja and uh, she's going to discuss maternal mental health in much more depth. So thanks for your time, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nirja Chaudhary from the WHO. I'm truly excited to speak to all of you at this important consultation. Taking over from Sarah, who has illustrated to us the challenges we face in maternal, in maternal health, let us now move on to some facts on mental health. The numbers are alarming. Close to a billion people, that is 13% of the world's population, are deemed to have a mental disorder. Of particular concern is the mental health conditions during adolescence and childhood, which are on the rise. In fact, 14% of the world's adolescents suffer from a mental disorder. Apart from causing personal losses to people affected, families and communities, the societal costs of depression and anxiety are daunting. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are taking an enormous toll on our mental health. We are seeing devastating impacts of social isolation and socioeconomic pressures, and the great need to transform and scale up mental health services across the globe. This need is further emphasized by the numbers you see here of the high mortality that is attributable to suicide, not least of all in young people, and the mortality from harmful use of alcohol and drugs. Uh, despite the enormous burden of these conditions, mental health is still one of the most neglected areas of public health. Although effective treatments are available in low and middle income countries, we see that more than 75% of people with mental, neurological and substance use disorders receive no treatment for their condition. Under treatment is also widespread in high income countries, where on an average, only a quarter of people with depression receive even minimally adequate treatment. As the 2017 Mental Health Atlas tells us, some of the reasons for this is due to the woefully inadequate human resources for mental health and the fact that on an average, countries spend just 3% of their health budgets on mental health. This is so counterintuitive, in fact, if you take into account the fact that mental health services are not costly and countries can in fact stand to gain by investing in mental health. Another reason to address mental health is the fundamental connections between mental and physical health. Many mental disorders, major non-communicable diseases, and certain communicable diseases, such as HIV and tuberculosis, have many common features. They share common determinants. They also have commonalities in their consequences. 
all lead to significant levels of disability, which in turn diminish socioeconomic opportunities. Mental and physical illnesses do tend to occur together, and when they do co-occur, the outcomes of both conditions is far worse. Let me try and illustrate this with an example. Low socioeconomic status increases the risk of trauma or neglect during childhood. This in turn increases the risk of anxiety and depression both in early life and later in life, which can increase the risk of harmful use of alcohol or drugs, and then increase the risk of exposure to HIV. When depression occurs with HIV, it leads to double stigma, affecting health-seeking behavior and uptake of diagnostic and treatment services for HIV, and reduced adherence to antiretroviral treatments and worse, worse health outcomes. You can see how all of this is so relevant to women in the perinatal period, but we'll come to that soon. The consequences of not taking action and continuing to neglect the urgent need to scale up mental health services are potentially devastating. Failure to tackle the growing burden means more people living with the daily distress caused by poor mental health. It also means higher rates of premature death from harmful use of substances and suicide, as well as from the comorbid physical conditions. Global economic losses total some one trillion US dollars per year. There will be ongoing human rights violations of people living with mental health conditions, and the intergenerational consequences are particularly compelling. Mental health conditions impact the potential of the next generation to live fulfilling lives. Children and adolescents will have poorer education outcomes, reduced cognitive and social development, and ultimately greater risk for poverty and long-term mental health conditions. Now putting together what Sarah described to us about maternal health and what you just heard about mental health, let's see what happens when we view these together. Maternal mental health refers to a woman's mental health during pregnancy and the postpartum period and encompasses the full spectrum of mental health problems that can affect women during pregnancy and up to one year postnatally. Depression and anxiety are the most common conditions in the perinatal period, but there is growing evidence on the importance of other conditions such as bipolar disorder, psychosis, alcohol and drug use disorders. Let us also not forget that fathers or other primary caregivers are also at a risk of stress, anxiety and other mental health conditions during the perinatal period. You've already heard some of these numbers spoken about before. In low and middle income countries, the prevalence of perinatal depression in women is estimated to be as high as 20%, that is one in five women. In addition, up to 20% of women with perinatal mental health conditions experience suicidal thoughts or undertake acts of self-harm. COVID-19 has taken its toll on this population too, with reported prevalence of depression and anxiety in pregnant women being around 70% higher than in the pre-pandemic period. The presence of a mental health condition can cause a woman to feel ashamed and worthless. Women have described this experience as akin to living hell, being at the bottom of the life, and being a totally different person to who they used to be. They also report feeling isolated and unable to share their feelings. Health impacts are not least due to a decrease in health seeking, including for antenatal and postnatal care, with poor obstetric outcomes, and often compounded by unhealthy choices. I've already mentioned the unacceptably high suicide rate. Depression and anxiety in women during the perinatal period can affect the parent-child relationship, child care abilities, and lead to parenting difficulties. The consequences of untreated maternal depression is also seen on the child and is associated with an increase in a range of psychological and developmental disturbances in children. For example, children of mothers with depression are almost one and a half times more likely to be underweight and stunted. But there is good news, and the good news is that treating maternal mental health conditions improves the mental and physical health of the woman and also has the potential to improve child health and development outcomes. Today, we have a historic opportunity to move mental health up in the global agenda in both words as well as deeds. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for a collective movement to improve mental health services worldwide. 
Later in this session and throughout the next three days, you will hear more about interventions and initiatives for mental health. You will hear that there are evidence-based interventions for the prevention and treatment of these conditions. These interventions can be provided as a part of routine maternal and child health care by trained non-specialist health workers. They can be delivered in a stepped manner. That is, basic psychosocial care and support can be delivered to all women, while those at risk for depression or anxiety or those who have these conditions can be provided further treatment and referral to specialists if needed. So let me end by reminding ourselves that there is no health without mental health. And in fact, after you've just heard what you've just heard, you'd agree that there is no health without maternal mental health. Thank you so much for listening. And I now hand over the baton to Shannon to take you through an analysis of what is being done for maternal mental health currently. Shannon, over to you. Thank you, Nirja. And thank you everyone for taking your time today to join this conversation. I'm going to present some of our findings from a maternal mental health uh, landscape analysis from low and middle income countries that we conducted as part of the Momentum Country and Global Leadership Award. So here's the outline for my presentation today. I'll expand on some of what Nirja noted as far as definitions and prevalence, share our methodology for the landscape analysis, provide a brief overview of our findings, and some of the discussion points that have emerged. The landscape analysis focused on common perinatal mental disorders. As Nirja mentioned, these typically include depression, anxiety, and somatic disorders, focusing on the physical manifestations of suffering. There are other forms of mental illness, such as psychosis, bipolar, and substance abuse. For the purpose of this landscape analysis, though, we stuck to CPMDs. Um, in this. The period of time that we use is from pregnancy up to two years. The literature does vary um, from up to six weeks postpartum to one or two years. We'll also talk about the important role of suicide as a potential outcome of CPMDs that is playing a role in women's lives today. So what did we do? A multi-tiered approach was used for our landscape analysis to allow for a broader understanding of the current state of perinatal mental health in low and middle income countries. This approach allowed us to um, look beyond research, but not excluding documents based on the quality of the design or the strength of their evidence. The scoping review really gives us the benefit of not only pulling together project reports, guidelines, opinion pieces, but also expert opinions. The second tier included qualitative data analysis. We conducted a total of 60 key informant interviews and two focus group discussions with experts in a variety of fields that play a role in perinatal mental health, including maternal and child health, mental health, nutrition, faith-based communities, and humanitarian actors, to name a few. Lastly, we conducted a policy analysis of 19 countries to assess what mental health policies existed how detailed or not they were in regards to explicitly mentioning maternal mental health. So what did we find? Um, so what impact does mental health have on mothers and pregnant people? We all hopefully agree that it's a woman's right to good mental health, but as Nirja noted, we found that there are several clinical implications for women with CPMDs such as being less likely to attend antenatal and postnatal care visits, and more likely to experience obstetric complications, among others. And given this link to morbidity and mortality that Sarah mentioned, these are very important factors to pay attention to. There are also significant impacts on the newborn and the child. In an effort to understand how the mother-baby dyad is impacted, it's important to also look at the impact on the clinical and developmental outcomes of children that are influenced by a mother's mental health. As you can see here, there are several important implications such as stunting, oops, sorry, sorry, um, such as stunting, low birth weight and poor cognitive development. Of note though, is there's a call in many of the articles and in our key informant interviews to further explore the causal pathways between CPMDs and child outcomes. There are many confounders that may play a role here that are often not fully investigated. 
There have been several articles discussing interventions and programs that show an improvement in maternal mental health with targeted interventions, but not necessarily a resulting improvement in child outcomes. So more work is needed to be done here. There we go. Um, so here's a graphic we created in an effort to show the intergenerational and cyclical nature on the impact of CPMDs. And I've noticed that women often have more than one child. So these risks are not, off, not one off moments, but rather occurring, reoccurring exposures. The risk factors are overwhelming at first, and many of them fall outside of the quote health arena. But any intervention to address CPMDs will have to take into account these risk factors. We structured them here in categories, but they really do range everything from gender norms to stigma, racial or religious persecution, women with lack of economic opportunity or suffering from malnutrition, women who experience obstetric trauma or give birth to small and sick newborns in communities with high rates of gender-based violence and low levels of social support. All of these have been found as risk factors in the literature and also in lived experiences of women we spoke with. So what is being done? As Nirja noted, there are quite a few intervention and programs being implemented globally to address CPMDs. Here we have an illustrative table that shows intervention approaches that had at least two rigorous evaluations conducted that show positive outcomes for either the mother or the newborn and the children. Many of these are approaches to address maternal mental health that are integrated within existing programs and platforms using lay health workers, such as community health workers, or existing nutrition or early childhood development programs, early child development programs. One of the challenges has been finding interventions or identifying interventions that improve both the maternal and the newborn outcomes in one package of interventions. The barriers are not surprising, to, um, but they came up over and over again. These are both barriers to seeking and receiving care. They were the social and then the health systems implementation factors. So the social factors, the impact of stigma cannot be understated in both seeking and receiving care for women around the world but this came up significantly in the low and middle income country literature. The reinforcing cycle of violence and food insecurity. This question of is a woman food insecure because she can't keep a job due to her depression or is she depressed because she can't find a job to feed her children. Gender norms around what it means to be a woman, a mother, her value and strength in childbirth and child rearing. And the health system factors, voltage drop, so here's what the term used to describe what happens when interventions can go to scale, but there's a reduce, reduction in quality, a loss of staff, not covering all of the topics and group sessions. Data was found to be weak and non-existent to make decisions based off of. The lack of coordinated efforts and attempts to have vertical siloed programs. This was an issue that was mentioned quite a few times in our humanitarian interviews as well. Human resources, something that was alluded to earlier, it's not just the number of human resources, but also providers spoke of the competence and confidence to help the women that they see on a regular basis. And lastly, lack of financial support. Without explicitly being named in policy, oftentimes there was not funding or money linked to the support services. On measurement, so the measure, oh, sorry, this clicker. Mm -hmm. Um, the measurement of CPMDs is usually used, done using screening tools. There are about six that are most often uses, used, but so we found some, uh, some reviews identified more than 20. There were several challenges that were noted in the literature and by key informants in terms of measurement. The first is that there are several different tools being used with different cutoffs, different definitions, making aggregation very difficult. Key informants also noted that even when tools are created in high income com countries, but adapted in the low middle income country setting to the context, they still seem to be impractical and not sensitive to the way that women experience and express mental ill health or suffering. And lastly, there's some interesting debates as to the value of a one off screening tool, especially when mental illness is described in different ways and experienced at different times and different moments. Does it help to identify a woman as having CPMD in one moment if she's having a bad day? 
or she's having a good day? And how do you provide support and psychosocial services over time that could have a positive impact on all women without needing a screening process initially? So here, given what we found, what are some of our takeaway discussion points? We used a modified version of the consolidated framework for implementation research to lift out the core components of successful interventions. At the community level, there were five identified components. The first is a stepped care model, as was noted earlier by Nirja, starting in the community and having strong referral systems in place that have services available to women. A detailed assessment of the context. Too often our informants mentioned how rarely women in com and communities are actually brought into the discussion about what services, intervention, and the realities that they're living in. This is especially important in conversations around mental health needs of adolescent girl populations. Talk therapy describes a wide variety of dialogue-based treatment options, and in low- and middle-income countries, these have been delivered successfully through non-specialist health workers. Contextualized language for CPMDs. So closely aligned with the detailed assessment, but the right language, descriptions of pain, suffering, idioms, they're fundamental to accurately assessing a woman's mental health. And lastly, but very practically, a task sharing model starting at the community level within the community and relying on the assets of the community, but well supervised has been shown to be both feasible and necessary. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> there are also core elements of successful interventions at the facility level. So pre-service training on mental health, especially the midwives we spoke with, mentioned the lack of training during schooling that left them feeling unprepared to meet women's mental health needs. The assessment process, identifying an assessment process that ensures one, is it the right tool? Is it accurate language? Is there privacy for the assessment? What is the format? Is the woman to be filling out a document by herself? Is this the midwife's job? Is it done during ANC and how often? Providers need training and supervision in how, how to deal with women who are experiencing CPMDs and having access to someone who can guide them when they meet a woman whose needs are beyond their training. Certainly in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, few could argue against the need for mental health support for healthcare providers themselves and very practical services that will go beyond some of the more superficial ideas. A clear referral pro pro uh, process, a core function of any health system really. Respectful maternity care, so how women are treated during pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum matters, and it has an impact on their mental health. So the push for perinatal mental health should be linked to the respectful maternity care movement. And lastly, gender-based violence is such a strong driver of CPMDs that any program or intervention trying to improve women's mental well-being needs to be linked with and strengthened through existing GBV services. And there's some adaptable elements. So how do we properly compensate community health workers for additional workloads? There needs to be a link with the global push to professionalize and fairly compensate community health workers in any CPMD sustainable and scalable intervention. There needs to be an identification of the trusted delivery agent. This will vary by context. Is this a community health worker, a grandmother, or a peer? And lastly, what's the best tool to use for screening assessment or measurement and what tools use for what purpose? And that will shift over time. Great. So where do we be begin integrating? There was a resounding call for integration of perinatal mental health services into existing platforms, a notion that we can't afford to have a vertical siloed approach. And by looking at the various risk factors, it's obvious that this will have to be a multi-sectoral strategy. There are a few suggestions for where to integrate, and these are not necessarily set up as an either or, but rather a potential for various places for integration. I'll talk about two here. The first is the notion of using children as a Trojan horse in communities where stigma is too much to break through or where there are strong existing platforms for child health or early child development, this may be the best way to introduce maternal mental health interventions, though the concern exists for taking away the primary focus on the woman in these situations. A second area for integration is through the traditional healers or faith-based organizations. 
Given the prevalence and the role of faith in communities, this may, a success, may be a successful avenue for integration. So where are the gaps in knowledge? There's a range of contexts of, in a, sorry, there are numerous gaps in terms of uh, evidence and implementation strategies. They range from knowing what works, in what context and why, how to meet the unique needs of vulnerable populations, and how to expand our knowledge base beyond postnatal depression, which is most often written about. There are also several areas we need to further evidence on to continue to provide person-centered care at scale. So there was a clear sense in the key informant interviews that the time is long overdue to take the issue of perinatal mental health seriously. And in many cases, there was an appreciation for the increase in attention. Interestingly, many of the questions that emerged as crucial to reducing the burden of CPMDs on women are nearly the same as those we've been asking in the global health community for years. It doesn't make the questions any less important, but it does beg the larger question of how the global community will meet the needs of women and families by tackling some of these essential questions that have remained unanswered in other health sectors. The questions for CPMDs that emerged at the national level around what are the best strategies for introducing policy at a national level that'll actually result in funded services at the community level? How do we integrate services in the current funding environment and within the existing health systems? And how do we frame the solutions from a more asset-based approach? At the facility level, how can we care better for the healthcare workers' mental health, and especially those working in humanitarian settings? How can mental health become part of pre-service and in-service training? And yet, how do we support providers today who are encountering women with mental health needs? All right. And lastly, how to rely on existing services and platforms, but not overload community health workers with yet another set of responsibilities and tasks? And what are the ethical implications involved in telling a woman she's suffering from CPMD or more serious mental conditions when there's no service to refer her to? So these are some of the findings of our landscape analysis. And I know many of the issues that I've brought up here today will be discussed in more detail over the course of the next three days. So thank you. And now I shall pass the floor over to Dr. Jane Fisher. Thank you very much. And thank you to the very eloquent presentations we've had. I'd like you to begin, change your way of thinking now to imagine that you are young, pregnant, not, not at a time of your choosing and you're living with very few resources in a dwelling without an internal water source or a toilet. You're often hungry. You haven't had access to more than the early years of primary schooling. And the context is one in which all household work and infant care is a woman's responsibility. You give birth to a girl in this setting where there's a strong preference for male children. And the baby's difficult to feed and soothe. Her crying causes your husband to get angry and threatening. He calls you crazy, a poor mother. In this situation, you feel despondent, as though the tasks of daily life exceed your capacities. You're profoundly lonely, and you can see no way for life to become easier. An authoritative health specialist tells you that you are mentally ill with the clear implication that another woman in this predicament would not be experiencing this. Next slide, please. This recognition is perhaps an advance on what might have occurred 20 to 30 years ago, when it was being argued that women in low-income settings received traditional care involving an honoured status and mandated rest and that they therefore were not vulnerable to mental health problems. However, uh, in our systematic review published now more than 10 years ago, 
we demonstrate that women in low and lower middle income countries were 50% more likely to experience a mental health problem during pregnancy or in the postpartum period. And we also showed that there was a social gradient in which women living in the community where they had little access to health services were in fact much more likely to experience these problems than women living in better resourced urban settings where they had access to tertiary hospitals. But it's illustrated for me most powerfully by this comparison between living uh, women recruited and assessed systematically in pregnancy in a private maternity hospital in Ballarat, where it was only 4%. But it was substantially higher in a rural provincial setting in Vietnam and very much higher in Pakistan in a conflict-affected rural area. Sorry, could you advance the slide, please? Vikram Patel reminds us that this difference in the prevalence of depression and anxiety can't be attributed alone to oversimplistic biological or hormonal explanations because few biological parameters have this degree of variability. The WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health reached the unambiguous conclusion that it was social circumstances that are the predominant explanation for differences in health status both within and among countries. And the Commission drew particular attention to the experiences of women and the adverse impacts of their social circumstances, in particular, their unequal access to opportunities and rights and their disproportionate experiences of discrimination, subordination and exploitation on the burdens of disease that they carry. The Commission provides us with this very helpful conceptual framework which explains that the intermediary factors in women's lives, the circumstances in which they live, their access to resources and the behaviour of other people towards them have a major impact on their health. But also the structural determinants, policies about equity of access to education and income generating work, effective implementation of laws about domestic violence and reduction of household poverty all determine women's mental health. Next slide, please. We investigated changes in the prevalence of CPMDs in an analysis of two studies using identical methods in rural Vietnam. And we wanted to compare the social uh, and economic characteristics in this same community in 2006 and 2010 and investigate in what way it was linked to maternal mental health. Next slide, please. What we showed was that there'd been an enormously rich policy environment in which laws had been implemented on gender equity, on domestic violence prevention and control, and laws on universal health insurance had been implemented, and uh, policies about poverty reduction and hunger eradication. Next slide, please. What we found was uh, that there were enormous changes in women's circumstances across this interval. More women had completed secondary education. More were working in salaried work in factories rather than as farmers. Fewer women were living in households with low household wealth. And more women said that their pregnancy was welcome and chosen because they had access to contraception. Women were pregnant at on average 13 months older than they had been five years before, more intended to breastfeed. But importantly, fewer of them were experiencing coercive control from their intimate partners. Next slide, please. So there were no changes in health services or the health system across this interval. And we found there was a significantly lower population prevalence of pregnancy CMD symptoms 
and that it was associated with poverty reduction and with lower levels of coercive control in intimate partner relationships and that these had made this profound impact quite apart from any health sector uh, change. Next slide, please. The uh, links between poverty and all indicators of uh, CMDs are absolutely uh, consistent and clear. If people have inequitable access to education, food insecurity, they're living in a low socioeconomic position, they are inevitably more vulnerable to this form of uh, mental health problem. Next slide, please. So what this review found was that addressing CMD burdens through individual level interventions can only have limited impact and that in any endeavours to improve mental health, we have to think about much wider public policies, including those about personal safety, access to education and income generating work, and uh, ensure that there are adequate welfare and health safety nets. So program and health services responses are necessary, but insufficient to bring about the change that we're seeking. Next slide, please. So if we return to the woman we imagined, I'd like you to consider whether it would be more helpful to her if we understood and addressed her need for access to economic security, adequate housing, personal safety, reproductive choice, education, and full rights to social and economic participation, and did not label her as mentally ill. We have an extraordinary opportunity in this technical consultation to be transformative, to recognise that what women are experiencing is a form of what Arthur Kleinman calls social suffering or psychological distress related to circumstances. This does not mean that the experiences should be ignored or neglected but that we need to be very thoughtful about the language we use to describe the woman in her predicament. We need to avoid victim blaming. We have to ensure that structural factors are addressed at the same time as uh, addressing the needs of a particular woman. So we all need to be advocates for public policies that are linked to mental health, as well as to, um, developing strategies to recognise and respond to their needs. Thank you. I'd like now to pass to Fadzwa. Thank you very much. If I may have my slide. So after all is said and done, why not bring perspective from a realistic point of view? And in this regard, looking at the case of Zimbabwe and also adopting and adapting to Afrocentric responses. We look at the pressures that the rural woman faces in Zimbabwe, farming, fetching water or firewood, the household chores, the mental health, which is the focal point of her existence, the cultural barriers, these are the pressures that a rural woman faces and not just any woman, but the pregnant woman. So on top of the burdens that she will face as a pregnant woman, you will find that this woman in question still has household chores that await her. She still has to provide for the household. And this is not just a nuclear household, it's a community, it's the extended family and everyone else that she may be expected to serve as a woman. And I use the word serve because that is what it ends up being when one is made to work despite the circumstances that she may be in. We look at the pressure for a boy child who is considered human. And I would like to say that again, the pressure for a boy child. And I pose this question, who is considered human? The term munu in our 
in our local language here in Zimbabwe, which is one of them, which is Shona, describes a person. But when we look at the value of the so-called person, when it comes to giving birth, not only are you burdened with what are you carrying, when are you carrying, you are married or you have a partner that is known. The next that the world expects from you, the community expects from you, is that you be pregnant. The pressures that come along with being pregnant, let alone when the child is born. Locally, they will ask, Munui, as in what human have you given birth to? And if it is a boy child, they say, Kwavani Mun which in other words means there is a human being. So this word has already been taken from its main meaning, which is a person, to define that a person is just the boy child. Yet when you give birth to the girl child, the celebrations are not the same. You normally get, you will try again next time and you will give birth to a boy child. This alone continues to give pressure to the woman until she manages to conceive a boy child and she will be acknowledged as one of the women in communities. Evidently, the joy the boy child brings is larger than that of just giving birth to the girl child. The question we have to ask ourselves today is, and then what? Given all these pressures, Carrying a heavy bucket of water, a huge load of firewood on your head from distance that are unimaginable when you are fit. What more when you are pregnant? How much more can this pregnant woman take? And this is only the physical aspect that the eye can see. And how can we tap into existing resources that communities have and create solutions? Solutions that come from the heart of communities, solutions that capture the skills that the communities have amongst themselves, solutions that communities can relate to and can adopt without having the feeling of external imposition. Rather than adapting Western interventions, which at this point we must say some have been very useful, and integratable within the mainstream of maternal mental health and maternal health. But the absence of adapting and adopting to what is local, to what is relatable, leaves one wondering, where are we going with maternal mental health, if we are going anywhere at all? But the answer lies in the Afrocentric interventions where we will find that it is most suggestible to adapt and adopt to that which is common amongst the communities. One such example is the Mbuyanya Mkuta, which is an initiative to create maternal mental health awareness and reduce maternal morbidity and mortality. For the definition, Buyanya Mukuta is an elderly woman who acts as a midwife in the community. And this aims to create maternal mental health awareness and reduce maternal morbidity and mortality, as we have alluded to. When we look at who should we engage, it's the local leadership, it's the partners. And we cannot have conversations about women's health, about maternal mental health without the inclusion of of the men. The men are the supporting structure which are key to the change that we want to see. And the objective of this is to train some of the women so we have lay maternal mental health workers that assist the mainstream maternal health sector in the country. At this point, we would like to say that given the pressures and expectations the demands on women, how can we help address their mental health in a way that resonates with them, using resources that are found within the communities 
that create Afrocentric solutions, solutions that come from communities, the skills that the communities have always had that need to be positively harnessed. So rather than adapting interventions that are Western, let's start with what we have. As a declaration, I would like to say, I am a woman, I represent women. I represent the continuity of life. I can only do this with the support of those around me. I can only do this if I am aware of the challenges, celebrating the joys and empathizing with the tears of motherhood. I stand for maternal mental health advocacy. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our phenomenal panel of speakers and for helping to set the stage for our discussions over the next three days. I hope it came across loud and clear that there is an undeniable and urgent need to take the issue of perinatal mental health seriously and that cost-effective and feasible interventions exist and they can be implemented. To move forward will require a balance between generating better evidence while concurrently implementing programs and approaches to help the millions of women suffering in silence every day. We hope the next three days provide a seminal opportunity to inspire, to educate, and to accelerate action. So thank you for joining us. This concludes our session. Our next session, titled Common Perinatal Mental Disorders, Current Evidence and Gaps, can be accessed via the main stage or by clicking on the agenda page and the session title. It will begin in a few minutes, so please join us there. Thank you so much.